Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to our webinar on Generative AI's role in private equity. Today, we'll delve into how Generative AI is transforming the private equity landscape, focusing on three critical areas, value creation, the co-pilot model for private equity, and the pivotal aspects of adoption drivers and change management. I am David McGraw, your moderator for today's session. With over 15 years of experience as an AI and ML solution and product architect, I currently serve as a senior director in the generative AI practice at Alvarez and Marsal. Joining us today are two distinguished speakers who brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to our discussion. First, we have Anil Kumar with more than 20 years of experience in private equity consulting. Anil leads the generative AI practice at Alvarez Marsal it has been at the forefront of integrating generative AI into private equity, spearheading the development and the deployment of AM Assist, which has a configuration dedicated to deal lifecycle management. Anil's expertise extends uh, to technology and operational diligences, carve outs, performance improvement, and merger integration. Our guest speaker is Matt Fish. He serves as a general manager at Microsoft for the Northeast region. He oversees the data and AI business. Matt's role involves guiding customers through their data transformation journeys to the cloud, emphasizing cloud scale analytics, reporting, leveraging Microsoft's AI and Azure's open AI technologies. With a rich background that includes roles at IP, IBM and KPMG, Matt brings over 20 years of experience in technology, providing a unique perspective on the intersection of AI data and private equity. Today's discussion promises to be enlightening, offering insights into how generative AI can serve as a transformative force in private equity. Let's, embar let's embark on this journey to understand the potential of generative AI in private equity. Anil, hopefully you're having a good day. Let's start with you. What is, your, <clears throat> what is the current landscape of generative AI in, the pri in private equity today? And is private equity's expectations changing as it relates to, to their engagement with consultants? Thanks, David. It's great to be on this webcast with you and Matt. As uh, you mentioned within a &M, we have built a generative AI platform called a &M Assist, which has been used on hundreds of our engagements with private equity funds to accelerate data gathering and doing a lot of the basic analysis, helping our staff move to more of the complex problem solving. It's helping us immensely increasing the value of the time that they spend on client engagements. Uh, it's great to have Matt on the call as well. Microsoft has been a great partner to us, and we've been working very closely with their AI product teams to implement Microsoft technologies, tools, and innovation in our platform. With respect to your question on the current landscape of generative AI in private equity, what we are seeing, David, is uh, that the large private equity funds have started to heavily invest in AI. They are hiring dedicated AI teams. They are developing series of internal AI platforms focused on uh, deal lifecycle management as well as portfolio value creation. The mid market funds are adopting AI at varying paces. So about, I would say 20, 25% of the mid-market funds are actively using AI. About 30% are in deployment and experimentation phase. And about half, 40, 50% are still in wait and watch mode, but we expect these numbers to shift pretty significantly in the next six months as more and more of private equity funds recognize the benefit and start implementing AI solutions. In terms of the, the way the private equities expectations are evolving with generative AI, we are seeing three areas where the expectations are evolving. One is around the speed of executing deals. So we are, we are seeing that over the next six months to a year, there's going to be an expectation that the, the deal timelines are faster because generative AI can accelerate elements of the deal making process. Second is the speed at which the problems are identified. That's uh, accelerating as well. 
And third is the depth of analysis that can be performed on the deal. With, with Generative AI doing a lot of the groundwork and initial analysis, the level of depth and comprehensiveness and richness of the analysis only goes up. So those are the three areas that we, we see the expectations evolving for private equity funds. And when we're talking to, and we've been talking to a lot of the private equity funds, right? Because we, we are right, uh, our platform is leading edge and then and, and we get to speak with many of the private equity funds, especially in the mid-market area. A key question that we get is, where does Generative AI have the most impact on the life cycle of a deal? And when they look at the deal life cycle, there's broadly four phases. The first is the diligence. Then you have the first 100 days. Then you have the hold period and then exit planning. And for each of these phases, Generative AI is transforming how the funds operate by going deeper. And what we see is a lot more of the work is being done right now on the diligence phase, but there's solutions being developed for the first 100 days, the whole period and exit planning. So in about six months to a year, we expect much more mature solutions on all of these phases. But as it stands today, there's a lot more emphasis on the initial pre acquisition diligence and performance improvement identification phase. In terms of the deal lifecycle management and, and, and both the portfolio value creation, we're seeing early issue detection. That's uh, with, with tools like AM Assist. You can do the trend analysis, the initial trend analysis. What's been the big changes in sales, in headcounts, in margin, in production capacity, for example? These are areas where we can use the technology to identify these trends very quickly. And then you, we get to access their rooms, right, which could have thousands of documents. But in just a few hours, you can find these specific facts the specific metrics that you look to identify problems and red flags very quickly. Things which, you to, which used to take a week or two weeks to do the analysis can be now done in a few hours, helping us identify the red flags, the yellow flags and the green flags, and enable us to focus more on the red flags. In terms of the chain of thoughts, that's a concept that we've developed within our platform, and that, that's very interesting, and that's driving a lot of the process around how you look at the problem. So we've implemented what's called private equity chain of thoughts. This is the concept where we try to mirror a private equity approach to problem solving and risk identification. So we've interviewed with hundreds of our um, consultants around how they look at a particular problem in the context of, say, operations diligence in the context of an industry, in the sub-industry and so forth. We've used a lot of the our con configuration and training and prompting techniques to develop these private equity specific skills. So for example, if you want to identify gaps in a transition services agreement, TSA in a carve out, we have these private equity specific skills that, that's been developed and that's making us move faster. Uh, we've built a lot of knowledge bases which help us identify similar issues that we may have come across in the past. And this is a really important concept that's being developed, which is we use our own proprietary IP, our own experience on identifying issues to figure out where else have we come across these issues? What were the recommendations in that case? And so forth. The what, so what, now what, that's a concept that's embedded. That's, that's sort of the NM language that we talk about right when we are working with the clients. And that's something that we've embedded in analysis orchestration. Based on the analysis, what kind of questions should we ask? Based on those questions, what kind of data and metrics should we retrieve? And connecting the dots between them, what does it mean for the private equity fund in the context of the investment? So there's a lot of development, a lot of thought process that's evolving, a lot of expectations around generative AI that, that's evolving for private equity funds. But at the end of the day, what we see is that the speed of executing deals would accelerate the speed at which the problems are being identified is going to accelerate. And very importantly, the depth of the analysis that can be performed on a deal is, is going to improve. And this is very exciting times for private equity investment analysis. Anil, it sounds like the size of the PE fund often determines their maturity with Gen AI. It also sounds like you know, private equity is expecting a, a quicker deal time with more emphasis 
on complex analysis based on the information you provided us. Uh, thank you very much. Matt, uh, I've got a question for you. Um, what does the term co-piloting with generative AI mean? And why is it important to think about it in terms of co-piloting versus automation? Thank you, David. Thank you, Anil. Awesome to be with both of you. Super excited for this conversation and webinar. Uh, just such an awesome topic and such an exciting time to be in the AI space. Uh, just unbelievable last two years when you kind of think of pace of innovation, pace of acceleration, pace of adoption, um, all the things customers are doing and trying to do and looking to do with AI is really unbelievable. Um, I know this has been a super, uh, super exciting time for myself. I've been in the AI space for many, many years and the last two years, just the, the interest, the demand, um, everybody is looking how to really transform and truly uh, change some of the ways they've been doing business for a long time to really grow top line revenue, to really grow profitability um, and really transform across internal functions, line of business and external customer facing uh, products and solutions, leveraging AI. It's, uh, like I said, just a, a really awesome time to be in this space. Um, you bring up a, a great question, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, so when we talk about co-pilots, you know, within Microsoft, um, Copilot is truly a brand. Uh, Copilot is truly a brand within Microsoft. We talk a lot about, you know, AI um, and Microsoft. We leverage our own AI. We are one of our, if not our largest customer of our own solutions. And we do that in a couple of ways. One, we're leveraging AI um, and analytics and a lot of our own back office functions. When you think of transforming the call center uh, to reduce average handle time, to make our support center better for our customers uh, to dial in, that's happening. If you look at how we're transforming our office of the CFO with many different types of use cases, um, leveraging Gen AI, that's happening. When you look at how we've kind of started to use Gen AI to look at contracts and with our own legal um, department, um, that's all happening. And then you talk about the, 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 the adoption that we're having within our own solutions that we're branding Copilot. Um, and essentially, we have built um, and basically transformed a lot of our or workloads and solutions across all of our different functions um, and different parts of the business. Um, and we are in integrating and embedding um, generative AI into those solutions, hence calling them co-pilots. Um, when you think of things from uh, worker productivity to um, employee experience to security to development to some of the things that we're leveraging um, and building co-pilots within our uh, data one lake and uh, reporting in our new solution fabric. Um, it's pretty impressive and uh, the acceleration that we're doing it um, and customers are able to leverage pre-built uh, solutions where um, they can customize it, but a lot of the heavy lifting, if not all of it, is already complete. Um, it used to be when we first started, it was, do you build or do you buy? And now we've really um, kind of taken into the concept and seeing our customers taking the concept of build and buy and continue on um, uh, to extend. So really being able to um, build a use case you know, any use case um, that they've been looking to do, leveraging Gen AI plus, you know, many other services that wrap around it, um, or they can um, buy it through our different co-pilots that we offer and different solutions that we offer, um, or could customize those pre-built co-pilots um, to what makes their use case and what they're trying to do, and then continue to extend it. Um, we have a lot of different solutions that allow you to extend those um, or extend to the next co-pilot. Um, I'll also mention, you know, just kind of when we think of building your own co-pilots, there's still very much this element, I think people have heard the term human in the loop, right, where we're not replacing or displacing the human. It's truly the human in the loop, no matter the use case. When you think of certainly worker, worker productivity, um, it's not to displace the worker, it's really to make the worker more productive um, in their, uh, you know, during their, their work day, during their work week, um, to be able to focus on kind of helping them take over, helping them solve those mundane tasks and really allowing them to focus on, um, you know, more core priorities. Um, maybe they just haven't been able to get to just due to the amount of stuff they're having to do. Um, so I think th those co-pilots are, are helping there. So it's really that human in the loop, even with, you know, building these own um, 
building these own transformational use cases, very much human in the loop to be. I don't love the word anymore training. We used to use the word training a lot when it came to, to AI, but essentially being able to embed the right content, embed the right data. The number one use case we used to see very early on was this idea of chat with your data. We've got to figure out what's the right data to chat with. So the human in the loop, very much important to figure out where the right data is, where does it come from, uh, what quality of data is, is the data trusted, um, and then being able to leverage that and embed that um, into the Gen AI platform and Gen AI system. And then uh, last thing just on, on this question, I'll also mention is that, um, you know, the acceleration pace, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we've had really, you know, over the last two years has allowed customers um, to really speed up transformation. So a lot of these use cases now or co-pilots um, are in production and customers are really seeing ROI, positive ROI around this, where in the past there were barriers to entry to AI, um, you know, whether it was AI safety, bias and ethics, responsible AI, security, cost, skilling, there were a number of them. Those still exist today, but a lot of those have been reduced. And I will say a lot of the stuff around responsible AI, ethical AI, AI safety, security, is truly embedded and ubiquitous within our Azure Open AI platform. We really see that as priority number one, especially across a number of different industries. Um, you know where a lot of regulation, you know, industries are facing, um, and a lot of things where AI safety um, is is core um, to what they're doing. So it has been something we've been focused on well before Gen AI, um, and it's something we continue uh, to make top priority. But I appreciate the question, David. Back to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Matt. Funny story when we were naming our, when we were trying to name our platform, Copilot was one of the options, but we quickly realized that Microsoft owned that space. So we settled on Assist. Um, on that note, Anil, I'm going to ask you the same two questions. Uh, maybe you can provide a response and, and emphasize the, the private equity spin a bit. Thanks, David. <clears throat> yes, and we actually, it was not easy for us to settle on Assist because I think that the reason why we saw the need to name the platform Assist is, is to reiterate that it's not an automation platform for analysis, it's really an Assist. And I think that that took some time, and still it takes time, right, for, for folks and our staff to realize that if used properly with generative AI, uh, you can do a lot more with a lot less. Right. Certain kind of analysis you can do much faster. If you use pick and choose what generative AI is trying to help you with, and and, and in many ways you have to sometimes ignore what generative AI is trying to help you with. Because sometimes what you will get is a very generic response from generative AI. Uh, in some cases, for example, if the sales has gone down, the recommendation from Gen AI could be, well, the sales is going down, you need to hire more salespeople, but that doesn't really help. That's a very generic observation. Uh, so I think we've learned over the last year and a half of deploying NM Assist on 100 plus engagements is that it truly needs to be a change management exercise where generative AI is being used as an assist assistant platform, not an automation platform. Some of the things we've learned is that it's very important from a trust building uh, perspective to make sure that the way the data is being retrieved, the way you cite the references, we in our platform, we show exactly not just the file, but which page, which section, which paragraph, and we put a highlight around that in terms of telling where the information is coming from, and that goes a long way. But also in just in terms of the quality of responses, what are the multiple sources information is coming from? So I think even to make it truly an assistant platform, you have to work on the trust element of this, the quality of response, the accuracy, and citation. A lot of things that, that Matt was uh, saying resonated with us because because we learned just over, over a period of time that each of them just, just having a co-pilot model is the right way to think about it. When you look at the way we solve business problem, at the end of the day, it's really five big processes. You gather the relevant data, you do the basic analysis to identify the red flag, yellow flags, then you start forming some hypothesis around problems. And then you start thinking about some of the implications and remediations. And, and, and human 
in the loop is important for us, and, and there's not a single piece of number or analysis that we produce which does not have it validated, double checked by our staff. Um, so I think in terms of working hand in hand, uh, there's a lot of work that we have generated. I do early where if you have thousands of documents in the data room to be analyzed, we use generative AI. It's almost in finding needle in the haystack to put together a pattern recognition and implement our own pattern recognition onto the data sets. Once you do that, then we have our staff look at the in, in information and make the call when, when, whether they accept that analysis uh, or not. In some cases, you have to go a little deeper. You have to do a lot more interaction with the generative AI platform, and that's just the nature of the co-pilot model here. In terms of analyzing trends, it's not just that we could have generative AI produce the initial trend, but really we have, as part of our upskilling, we teach our staff to do a lot more interaction. So if there's a graph, for example, a sales graph, it shows uh, uh, several categories of sales going up or down. We have very nuanced analysis that we train our staff to interact with, with our platform to get into the deeper dive analysis and not just take the word of Gen AI in terms of the broad high level analysis. Uh, same with implications and remediations. We have built a lot of our knowledge base. So it's not just what Gen AI is saying. We really have to look into our knowledge base to validate if we have come across the similar issue in a similar industry, in a similar sector in the past. And if so, use that to do the validation and double checking. I think and Matt, Matt, Matt uh, pointed out really well is overall, the once you start implementing the co-pilot approach in an efficient way, which comes really from experience, a lot of it, what you start seeing is a much more disciplined approach to private equity investment analysis or, or the work. You're using much more pre-built frameworks and AI-enabled gathering and, and an enhancement of the, of the analysis. We are starting to move our staff from data gathering and basic analysis to more of the complex analysis. So that's another the benefit of co-piloting. We're doing a lot more comprehensive, richer, deeper dive analysis. And then we are enabling a lot of quality assurance on the work that we produce. So in conclusion, co-piloting is really about creating almost a synergistic partnership with where Gen AI adds value having a healthy skepticism towards generative AI produced content, making sure that you have the tools and technologies to double check and make it easy for our staff to do that. And then with this collaboration between generative AI and, 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 and the use case development and the staff, I think you can do a lot more with a lot less. Thank you, Anil. Yeah, I think back, right, not so long ago, we would get feedback from some of our internal users suggesting that we'd have issues because the tool didn't fully automate some of the tasks. But we, you know, over time we have we have created our canned response, which is basically, hey, that's not a bug, it's a feature. We're essentially doing what we can to to enforce a human in the loop. So, you know, based on what both you and Matt said, I, I think it's extremely important to point out that right now we're at we're at the technology of Gen AI is at it's a co-piloting tool, not an automation tool. So finally, last question, Matt, I'm coming back to you. How, many, how can firms foster a culture of innovation and adaptability that embraces AI enhancements? Thank you, David. Um, love this question, get this question often, and uh, it's something I've thought a lot about, and I know um, many, many customers have been thinking about this and thought a lot about this. Um, as you see, there's a number of things on this slide that we can dive into, but I like to think of it in kind of three core buckets when you really think of, you know, culture and change um, when it comes to adopting AI. One is really focus, and it should all be about the use case. The technology is important. The technology is exciting. Um, it is forever changing and moving super fast with different models, different capabilities, multimodal, so many different things happening. But the use case really should be 
at the core of what companies are really thinking about. What's that business transformation look like? What's that ROI? What are some of those areas that you haven't been able to get into that, that be able to do in the past that Gen AI is able to uh, really start to open up those doors? So I think one, really focus on what are those use cases and bucketing those use cases from a prioritization standpoint can be based off size, can be based off cost, can be based off ROI. There's a number of different factors, but really have the use case at the heart of the culture um, when it comes to AI too. Everybody needs to be a fan. And what I mean by that is we talk a lot about that within Microsoft is really being a fan of this technology. Um, no matter if you're a user um, in your day-to-day -day lives, personal or from a work standpoint, um, leveraging it to uh, help with work productivity or leveraging it to transform a use case, either internal or product-based or external customer facing, whatever it may be, be a fan of it. Share those insights, share those learnings, get excited about it, make others excited to try it, make others excited to explore that technology. One way we've seen that really be effective is this use of hackathons. Um, hackathons have been around, that methodology has been around a long time, but the idea of getting a number of different people from a number of different areas within the organization in a room, just to start you know, exploring different use cases, putting them up on a board, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. We've tried this before, it hasn't worked. Could we try it again? Really looking at um, you know, how to explore that and really build that excitement you know, across all the different lines of business. This really is not just about IT. This is across the board um, in the line of business. Um, really, everybody you know, being a fan of this, being excited, being curious um, to figure out how AI and generative AI can really unlock number of different business opportunities. And then the last the last one for me is um, change management. Um, and when we really talk about change management, I really think of, you know, this this has to be an organization thing. This cannot be, you know, a one off IT project or a one off line of business project. This really is a change management function um, where you know, line of business leadership, executive leadership from the top down is really all in, bought in, um, and really moving um, towards an AI first driven organization. And a lot of that is due to competition. I mean, everybody is either exploring, looking, or starting to do, or been doing, depending on the industry, depending on the company. Um, so everybody's at a different part of the journey, but I will say everybody is starting to look at getting on the journey or already have begun the journey. So it's really important from a change management standpoint um, to be all in um, and really exploring a number of different ways to use it. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the very entries are gone. So the idea that it's going to cost you know, a, a huge amount of cost has been changed, right? There's different ways to do it, smaller projects, um, much less cost now to explore and get started um, with smaller projects. So those are the three things I would really think about is use case at the heart of all the change, um, everybody being a fan, and then lastly, just the overall change management. As you can see, there's, there's a number of other things kind of from a pillars, you know, business strategy really also, you know, being at the focus, got to set a core business strategy on how you're going to leverage AI and the technology strategy strategy, very, very important, really should mesh closely with the business strategy. Um, and then the experience, right? Whether it's customer experience, um, when we first started, um, the number one use case was chat with your data, and it was all about employee experience. Coming off of COVID, where employee experience was just booming. Um, and Gen AI fit perfect in that with that chat with your data employee experience. What does that experience look like from an AI strategy? Um, how's a customer really going to be able to use it? How's an employee going to be able to use it? Um, how's that training and skilling going to be done? How's that going to be rolled out? So kind of that overall training uh, strategy and experience part of AI. We talked a little bit about organization and culture, and I'll just land, uh, end on governance. So yeah, I think everybody's heard and, and, you know, for many, many years around data governance. Um, very popular term uh, for many, many years and a lot of times was focused on tools. Uh, but I, uh, the companies that I saw do really well with data governance were the companies that really had a focus on process. And I think AI is very similar. We have many customers that have started COE, Center of Excellences or Center of Competencies. Um, but yes, it's about the tech and it's about picking the right models and it's about the skills. But a lot of it also is around the governance piece and the process in place. How are we going to take these use cases in? How are we going to 
get everybody enabled? How are we going to get folks to really start adopting it? And once they start adopting it, how do we accelerate that adoption? Um, what tools do need to be in place? What process needs to be in place to be able to support that adoption? So I'd say overall AI governance from the top is very important. We've seen it in many different places with organizations, whether it sits in IT, whether it sits under a chief data officer, chief digital officer, sits you know under a CFO, many different places it can sit. But the idea is that that structure is in place to really support this adoption and support the acceleration um, that's really needed to, uh, to to really kind of have that change and the, the ability to go fast when it comes to adopting AI. But I love the question. Thank you, David, for asking. Thank you, Matt. Matt, had you had you asked me, you know, when uh, Anil, myself and the rest of the team started our journey down uh, building a and M assist, what would be the most difficult thing? I would have said, oh, the technology integrating all these technologies. Uh, you know, fast forward to today, the technology was the easy piece compared to the change management. So again, thank you for those insights. I think that's going to be uh, uh, very helpful to the audience and and to myself as well. Um, you know, first, first to our speakers, Anil, Matt, you know, thank you for sharing your expertise and your perspectives. You know, to all of you listening and watching, thank you for joining us today for this inf insightful discussion on, on the transformative role of generative AI and private equity. We hope you found the session valuable and gained a deeper understanding of how Gen AI can drive value creation, enhance the co-pilot model, and navigate adoption and change management. If you have any further questions or would like to continue the conversation, please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, have a great day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you.